<laughs> Villains. They're the bad guys you love to hate, and the Animation Archive is a treasure trove filled of classic, timeless animated baddies. Ranging from films from Warner Brothers, Disney and DreamWorks and such, but none are they more prevalent a threat than in the animated world of cartoons. Hi, I'm the Blue Artisan, a cartoon connoisseur if you will, and I'm going to be talking about my own personal top 10 favourite villains from cartoons. Caractacus P. Doom. Don't call me Lord This awesome Welsian cartoon caricature was the arch nemesis to the Avenger Penguins. The Avenger Penguins was a British made cartoon. It was created with the intent of poking fun of American Saturday morning cartoons, but with a little bit of a British twist to it. Obviously, they're referencing biker mice from Mars, but replacing the biker mice with penguins. I will be doing a review of the show in another episode. Getting back to Caractacus. He was on all kinds of different levels of crazy. He was practically a lunatic, and he had an ego just as large as his gut, which is pretty big. He has no real tragic backstory. Well, apart from the one he always monologues about in every episode. And they said that I was mad, 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 you hear? He has this great air of energy and excitement about him that he just absolutely loves doing evil things. He has a great lust of power and complete global control and has a bit of a dramatic flair about his character. Just a tiny bit. Lovely, lovely power! All will be mine! 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 He was eccentrically brought to life by Mike McShane. Wait a second, Mike McShane? The same Mike McShane who did the voice for Sid in Final Fantasy X? Worry! Evil Maker 1000 years! Who just well, there's a fun fact for you. Caraticus's base of operations was in his great big Tower of Doom, his skyscraper in homage to himself. Here he'd scheme and plot with his sidekick and also punching bag, his doubtful servant Harry Slime, the Igor to Caraticus's Dr. Frankenstein, if you will. And me, Harry Slime, too. It was here, in Doom Towers, where Caraticus would conduct his schemes to take over the world, producing his monster of the week from his great Monstertron, which is Caraticus's pride and joy. Who other than a genius could have created this? My masterpiece! The monster! Caraticus is a complete mould of what every comedic bad guy villain should be, and really enjoys poking fun at the role. He doesn't take himself too seriously, but just goes with the flow with being evil, bringing a flamboyant and over-the-top attitude to it, and I guess I could say he's a little mad. Me mad. Is an amplification of all that's mad, crazy, and bad, and for that I salute you, sir. It's me, Megaduck. Negaduck, the evil alternate counterpart to Darkwing Duck. He has all the same traits as Darkwing, like the big ego and narcissistic attitude, but instead of wanting a name for himself for fame and heroism, like his good counterpart does, he instead wants the fame for infamous villainy. Out of all the villains I've got on this list, he is without a doubt the most violent one of the lot, and demonstrates some really Looney Tunes-like behaviour, like being able to whip out his chainsaw out of nowhere. Which, while although is used for comedic visual effects, that chainsaw still looks like it could do some serious real-world damage. I mean, God, look at it! <laughs> the science of pain! <laughs> Gives me chills. Negaduck was voiced by Jim Cummings, and you can tell he was in his element voicing an evil character that was designed just for him. And it's up to me to knock him down, or my name isn't Negaduck! To me, personally, this was one of his best vocal performances, as he delivers a delightfully devilish flavour to the character. Negaduck's first appearance on the show was a little different because he was created by an accident by Megavolt, which ripped all the negative aspects out of Darkwing Duck and split his bad side from his good side, creating a Posy Duck and a Negaduck. He was such a popular character, the writers decided to bring him back as a main antagonist to the series. This more distinguishedly different Negaduck hailed from the comic book-like multiverse, where in this universe, Darkwing was evil and all that's bad reigned supreme. As such, this Negaduck, this Negaduck Point 2 you could say, was smart enough to go through interdimensional travel and make a name for himself, ruining Darkwing's career and becoming his arch nemesis. For a Disney villain, he's pretty much overlooked, which is a shame really, because he's pretty charismatic. But charisma aside, he's definitely a villain you don't want to end up on the wrong side of. <laughs> He 
is Hater's great, Hater's best villain, Lord Hater. And of course, like every other great villain, he goes by quite a few titles. The Duke of Destruction! The Monarch of Mayhem! The Greatest in the Galaxy! Lord Hater! He has quite a bit of an ego, I guess, but one key thing that distinguishes him from other villains on this list is the fact that he's probably the most metal of the lot. And wouldn't you be if you could shoot powerful green volts of electric lightning bolts from your fingertips? His main goal is rather more galactic, as rather than taking over the world, he'd rather take over the entire galaxy and prove that he's the greatest force of hate in the universe. Sure, you may think he might be a more of a tongue in the cheekbone kind of villain. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> but he had a pretty rad reputation, conquering and enslaving parts of the galaxy and established his great hate empire. Though he may come off as jockishly dumb. It's not fair! I should have won the trophy! I'm the greatest in the galaxy! I hate you, I hate you, I hate you! Don't doubt his powers, as he can show that when he's motivated enough, he can become an overpowered force of destruction. <laughs> Forget polite and proper. Forget witty and charming. I am not the ultimate gentleman. Wow! I am Lord Hater, the ultimate evil. When I want something, I take it. And I want your power now! Sure, Hater has his flaws, like wanting a soulmate to share his Hater empire with. Uh, anything about a girlfriend, like making out or even just holding hands or... I think that adds a great depth of empathy to his character. If creating villains was an art form, then Craig McCracken would be considered a master of this craft. And Hater to me would be his pièce à la résistance to the genre, as Hater is an amalgamation of all of Craig McCracken's greatest and most evil villainous character traits, which is what makes Lord Hater just simply the greatest in the galaxy. Complete with shrill voice and a great set of eyebrows, along with a penchant for villainy, it's the Monarch. And he's not just a villain, he's a supervillain. Though there is an irony in the fact that he chose a motif for his supervillainy under something that sounds impressive, he is in fact blissfully ignorant to the biology of butterflies. It was only later that I learned that monarchs migrate south for the winter, here, to Mexico. Oh sweetie, butterflies only live about nine months. <laughs> what? which adds a layer of depth of ineptitude to his character. Ow! Oh, right at my coccyx! Oh, oh. Right on your coccyx! That aside, he works with this villainous theme pretty well, being able to conduct and scheme some pretty intense plans to get rid of his arch, Dr. Venture. I have one question, Venture. How do you want to die? For, uh, reasons, I guess? Of course, no supervillain would be complete without his henchmen, and the monarch certainly has a lot of them. The monarch commands his henchmen from his great villainous lair, the cocoon, which while still fits with the butterfly motif, it does look at times a tad daft. Not quite sure what the flying pine cone is all about. But having said that, it can be used to tremendous effect when pulling off one of his dastardly schemes. The monarch just has a natural born gift for supervillainy and turns it into a fine art. He really revels in the devilry of being bad. You can tell he really loves his role when he delivers one of his passionate and inspiring evil monologues. Yeah. As long as blood flows through this heart, I will hunt you down. I will be the staff of your children's nightmares. Doctor Venture! He's just outright awesome evilness. He just fits supervillainy like a glove and fully embraces it. The monarch was just born to be bad. And as such, you should never underestimate the monarch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Montgomery Burns. And Mr. Burns. And Mr. Burns. He's Monty Burns. And Mr. Burns. No, no, you heard it right. It's Burns, not Burns. I was saying Burns. It's Kern, stupid. Um, <laughs> yes. It's the excellent Mr. Burns. As evil as Mr. Burns is, he holds the distinction of the most human on this list, as Burns is a horrible evil old man with an almost dead, cold and shriveled old heart. Mr. Burns started off as an archetypal sitcom boss, where he developed as a character as a force of fear and pressure, and had the almighty power, the power to fire his employees. You're fired. But I didn't say! You will. <laughs> As The Simpsons grew, so did Mr. Burns. Throughout the show's run, 
Burns got more and more characterised as an evil villain, by showing he had a stereotypical and evil wicked persona, as evidenced in all the jokes they had him showcasing. Fly, my pretties! Fly! <laughs> Continue the research. Burns doesn't have any supernatural powers, like most villains do. Nor does he invest his wealth in an outlandish villainous lifestyle. No, his power lies in the power of the almighty dollar and the capitalistic gains he gets with it. <laughs> take that spolderama, take that convenience smart, take that nuclear power play. Do fiddlesticks. Compared to the now ever increasing animated cartoon sitcom list, Mr. Burns was the first of his kind, being the main antagonist in this genre, and in doing so, has racked up quite the list of evil accomplishments. You ready? Here we go. <gasps> Ran over his employee's son, fell in love with Marge and tried to woo her, then proceeded to fall in love with Marge's mum and break up Grandpa's relationship with her, uh, maybe he's got a thing for long-haired chicks, I don't know, took over all TV and cancelled all beer deliveries just to get his old childhood toy back, hunts animals for fashion a la Quella de Vil style, tried to run for governor to hide his radioactive spillage and waste and environmental impact, created a recycling plant that also turned into a fishing machine that would wipe the marine life out of the ocean. And of course, who can forget the whole blot out the sun plot to monopolise on the energy consumption? Quite a list, right? And that's only a small select bits I could pick off from the top of my head. Sure, The Simpsons declined in years, and other animated sitcoms will come and go, but no other animated series will have an antagonist quite like Mr. Burns. And is, as Marge describes... He's an evil man! Yeah, just like that. Next time you think of an evil rich tycoon, you think of Monty Burns. Oh, sorry, rather. He's sadistic and cruel with power to boost, and he's turning up the heat. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, jokes aside, he's no laughing matter. So you're probably wondering why choose Ozai over Azula when she's clearly the more obvious choice. Well, for exactly that, he's not the most obvious choice. Okay, for me, the real main antagonist in Avatar was Ozai. He was carrying on his father's work, establishing the Fire Nation as the dominant bending elemental masters of the world. And he went on to implement his grandfather's legacy by continuing the grand scheme of the comic plan, which would dramatically increase the powers of the Fire Nation. Ozai, along with being the Emperor of the Fire Nation, is one of the most powerful firebenders in the world, and as such, it only elevated his arrogance further. He retitled himself above Fire Lord, proclaiming himself as the Phoenix King, which was kind of the first sign of his madness. Ozai, being so single-minded in his world-conquering quest, had no love to spare for his family, not even his children, which is evidenced when he banished his own son, Zuko, after defeating him in a one versus one no holes barred firebending match. Oops, this should be interesting. Ozai commands a strict, smooth and dominating voice. You will obey me, or this defiant breath will be your last! Played by the expert of villainous voices, Mark Hamill, and this role was certainly one of his most cool, calm, collected, but yet intense role he has portrayed so far. Coward! You think you're brave enough to face me, but you'll only do it during the eclipse. Okay, so more to the point now, here's what makes Ozai a truly great villain. He challenges Aang's pacifist ways, forcing him to confront his role as Avatar, making Aang doubt his role and want to abandon it too. And even when he consults his past avatars, they all lay down the law to him. He is the avatar, it's his duty to stop him. And even Ozai knows this, and as such toys with Aang. And this all led to an awesome climatic showdown between the two. In fact, I'd go so far to say that it's one of the greatest fight scenes I've seen in animation. It's powerful, intense, and a great clash of ideologies. And really makes you ponder, how is Aang going to stop him without snuffing out this guy's flame? Well, I certainly won't spoil it, but either way, Ozai makes for one hot and intense villain. You are right. I do have the power. I have all the power in the world! <coughs> he is the one who leads souls astray, and also has a little bit of a Blair Witch Aurora around him. It's the demonic entity known as the Beast, a more sinister and supernatural primeval force of darkness, inspired by many a deity from multiple mythos, all whom share the same intent of leading souls astray. The Beast lures lost souls for his own selfish wants and needs, marking those he has chosen as Lantern Bearer. He describes himself as the self-proclaimed ruler of the woods, his purgatory-like realm known as the Unknown. Beware the Unknown! 
Fear the beast and leave these woods if you can. The beast takes on a supernatural appearance as he is shrouded in shadow. And the beast's real appearance is, um, well, I won't spoil it for you as you'll have to see for yourself. The beast is one of those villains whose presence is felt more off screen, where the beast lore is built up through the people and characters and, of course, the world of the unknown. Pretty much Dark Souls like in a fashion, as the people of the unknown even sing songs about the beast. He lurks out there in the unknown, seeking those who are far from home, hoping never to let you return. Well then, perhaps we better make a deal. What's so refreshing about the beast is the fact that he's voiced by an operatic singer, Samuel Raimi, who has a vocal recipe of sweet, smooth, yet deep and honey-like voice, making it easy for you to fall into his deceitful charm. Come, Gregory. There is much to be done. And then you'll show us the way home, right? Of course. We made a promise, didn't we? The beast possesses an uncompromising and controlling personality, having to have things go his way. No, there is only me. There is only my way. There is only the forest, and there is only surrender. The beast may rule with threats and fear, but if you stand up and face the fear, which I guess is the moral of the story here, then the beast will have no power over you. Pretty much the same way the Goblin King came to an end in the labyrinth. The Beast is quite favourably considered one of Cartoon Network's more serious, threatening and intimidating villains. And it's really hard not to see why. The Beast has only ever appeared in a small handful of episodes, making his presence felt behind the scenes, further adding to the supernatural element of fear to this villain. Oh no! It's Bill! Right? Isn't that what you're all thinking? If there ever was a cartoon personification of Loki, Bill Cipher would be it. He's cocky, arrogant, self-assured, and has powers beyond all comprehension. And Bill's cycloptic, omnipotent gazing eye may know one or two things about our world. Oh, I know lots of things. Lots of things. Hobbies of Bill Cipher include subjecting those he chooses to terrorise with to B-movie-like horror punishments. How about instead I shuffle the functions of every hole in your face? <laughs> <laughs> Bill aligns himself with the forces of chaos rather than the forces of darkness like most villains usually serve. And while he may have the power cosmic at his disposal, he also has one glaring obvious weak spot. Ow! My eye! I'm not supposed to get pudding in it! I'm in hell! Yes indeed, Bill's godlike cosmic powers can in fact be restrained, and can only make contact with our dimension if you summon him and make a deal with him. So what puppet are you going to pick anyway? Hmm, let's see. Eeny, meeny, miny. Ow! For a chaotic deity, Bill sure is a funny name, but that stems from Bill being a reference to the dollar bill, hence his Illuminati inspired design from the almighty dollar. <laughs> Bill Cipher's origin is said to have stemmed from another dimension, the second dimension, where Bill doesn't remember it fondly. Imagine living in the second dimension! Flat minds in a flat world with flat dreams! Yeah, boring. But this could explain how Bill developed such a wild and crazy personality. Here, have a head that's always screaming. <laughs> Bill may wear a mask of fluff and niceties, but if things don't go his way, he will become a face of terror. I've got some children I need to make into corpses. See a real zoo. Bill Scyther certainly has made a few extra dimensional friends though I'd use that term loosely with Bill, as he uses them more as his own expendable minions. Classic villainous behaviour right there. Hench maniacs, you know what to do! Take them out! out! And though Bill didn't start off as the main antagonist to Gravity Falls, he certainly took the role on rather well, by becoming the central enigma and the main series mystery evil force. Bill Cipher brought with him a madcap craziness that we have never experienced before from any villain, nor indeed from any other Disney villain. And he finally met his befitting and final end to his reign of weirdness. Stanley! Well, at least I hope so, as he still may be out there watching you. I'll be watching you! <laughs> I 
Aku, the shape-shifting master of darkness. The Shogun of Sorrow, the deliverer of darkness himself, Aku. If the Beast was one of Cartoon Network's more serious villains, then Aku would be the most iconic and popular. And rightly so, as Aku is a living force of darkness and black magic. Aku's shape makes for an intimidating and striking yet simple form that showcases all his evil majesty at once. Facial-wise, he also resembles someone else quite famous in the animation world. Cracking cheese, Gromit lad. Aku made for a powerful antagonist to Jack, constantly trying to send his minions out to thwart him. And indeed so, like all good bad villains, if his henches don't deliver... You have failed me, Demongo. No, master. Please forgive me. No. Aku, as powerful as he is, is always threatened by Jack. As of course, Jack has the magical sword forged from purest light. So of course, what does Aku do? He uses all of his magical powers to send Jack through time. And oh boy, did that ever deliver for a great show. The dynamic relationship between Jack and Aku almost felt Tom and Jerry-like. Aku has a great many abilities under his belt. One of my favourites was his ability to shapeshift, as he makes for great, violent and threatening animals that really put pressure on Jack. It has not yet been destroyed, but now I, Aku, Dark Lord of all darkness, will make the final move. Aku's voice was perfectly villainous and was wonderfully wizardly and oriental. This was helped by the great performance of the legendary Mako Imawatsu, whose amazing vocal talents cemented Aku's brilliant yet evil and funny behaviour. I would like to place an order for delivery. Aku! I think I'm in the computer. Aku makes for an impressive and indomitable villain, and it's impossible not to include him on any villainous top 10 list. But as evil as Aku is, there's just one villain slightly better in my opinion. Honorable mentions. Its treasure shall belong to me, Spydra, once I eliminate Gadget Boy! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't resist. Oh, on to number one. Once more we travel to the land of nightmares to discover there beneath the black mountain of Vilthied, the loathsome Zordrak. Lord of Nightmares. The Dragon Lord of Nightmares, Zordrak. Oh boy, does that intro still give me the chills. Silence, no! Jeez, sorry, okay. Whew. Zordrak commands a terrifying presence that even makes his lackeys fear his summons. Blob, I am waiting. Probably wants to congratulate me. Job well ordered and supervised, expertly cooperated. <laughs> Zordrak was voiced by Gary Martin, who is a local British voice actor over here on UK telly. He began his vocal career playing such roles as the Honey Monster. Ha! How can anyone who played the Honey Monster command an evil and threatening presence? So, you dare the wrath of Zordrak? Vendor! Ah, okay, okay, he does more than an adequate job. Let there be nightmares! As he is the Lord of Nightmares, Zordrak's ultimate end goal is to end all pleasant dreams. Soon now, my Argorables, you will deliver my nightmares to everyone, because I will have the Green Stone. To achieve his end goal, Zordrak suddenly has a few magical court style abilities up his sleeve. These range from the standard firing electricity at will from his hands, petrifying those that oppose him, and every now and then can send his soul out of his body to possess other people. Complete. Zordrak certainly looks the part for our evil lord of nightmares, but did you know this as well? Before being called the fantasy style name of Zordrak, he was originally going to be named Nasta Shelfim, an anagram of Satan himself. But of course that would be too intense to name a evil character for a cartoon show. And it may be the nostalgia talking, but Zordrak was absolutely terrifying for me when I was younger, as Zordrak's image extrudes nightmarish terror and commands a great evil presence, both vocally and visually. That not only makes him a perfect animated villain, but the perfect fantasy villain. 
which is what makes Zordrak, to me, my own personal nightmarishly number one cartoon villain. This time, I will have the Dreamstone. The end of nice dreams. There will only be nightmares. Well, that's the end of my first video. I hope you all enjoyed watching it as I did making it. <laughs> How cheesy is that? <laughs> God. Seriously, though, I've been wanting to make this video for a long time as none of my villains ever get put in any top 10 lists. So, anyway, if you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content that'll be coming soon. I aim to upload new content once every two weeks. The next video I'm working on is a smaller one that's uh, more focused on a lesser known animation. And then I'll be working on my next big review. It's all rather exciting, isn't it? Well, anyway, stay tuned and subscribe to my channel for latest updates. You can follow me on my Twitter handles down here. And of course, you can also join my Facebook page as well for all the news, updates, and all the shindigs that I'll be up to. Links are in the description below. And I'll see you all real soon in the next video. Ta-ra!